It is good to have you all here. Thank you so much for coming. Let me open us with a quick word of prayer. Lord God, we ask that now you would be present with us. We ask that you would guide our minds into truth, uh, enable us to be able to robustly um, hold to only those things which are true and simultaneously to hold those truths in love. We pray that uh, our minds would be shaped with your help now, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my, my title is a bit of a misnomer. The published title for this seminar was, um, uh, well, the one that is on the materials is different from, from this one. So uh, that's the first reason it's a misnomer, because this, is, this was my original title, What the PCA Can and Should Learn from a Jew and Atheist and a homosexual. And secondly, it's a misnomer because uh, a lot of times there's a difference between your initial proposal and then after you take time to develop the proposal and write up the seminar, you realize that some things have, have changed. And so in this case, uh, we will be certainly looking at the influence of these three figures. And yet I realize that um, so many of my views of what I'll be addressing this morning have been very deeply influenced by numerous black intellectuals. So you'll be getting um, a little bit of a pastiche of thinkers, uh, the three thinkers uh, that have been mentioned as well as numerous other, other folks. I think a fitting subtitle for this seminar would be as follows, Dear Woke Christians, a plea for realism. It was about five years ago that I began uh, listening to and reading woke authors, uh, some of them Christian and some of them not Christian, on this subject of, of race in America. And it's just sad, I think, that some of these woke authors uh, really drove me to a Jew, an atheist, and a homosexual, to, to really listen to them, because frankly I was hearing a lot of things that were true from these uh, uh, decidedly unchristian thinkers. And my fear then and now is that some unbelievers are telling the truth while some uh, woke believers are not telling the truth. And I think that's, that's a sad thing. I, I recently heard something that was really quite chilling from an atheist philosopher by the name of Peter Boghossian. Maybe you've heard his name. Uh, if you look up the grievance studies hoax, and Peter Boghossian, then, then you can learn about this guy. Well, uh, th this is what uh, Peter Boghossian said in a recent interview. Uh, he's an atheist uh, as well, and he was deeply involved in the so-called new atheist movement back in the early aughts. And this is what he said. If I were to devise a plan to bring the whole thing down, all of Christendom, how would you do it? Make them woke, because it will eat itself from the inside. I would send a bunch of woke pastors into the church because they're going to tear everything down. They're going to make everything about identity, and then that's all they talk about. Justice, 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 but what does justice mean? Everything will revolve around diversity, equity, and inclusion. If I was the angry atheist that I was at some point and wanted to bring Christianity down, this is the plan that I would have hatched." End quote. Now, I, I hope that gets your attention. It, it certainly gets mine. Um, and to you who are here, if you consider yourself woke, to, to my woke brothers and sisters, uh, I, I want to aim for the next few minutes to present a compelling, factual, loving case for realism. Uh, and I want to plead with you that truth must drive the analysis and the re remedy for the racial problems that our, our country is, is facing. Uh, for those of you who are not woke and, and are here, I want to appeal to you to open your mouth and to speak the truth. Because staying silent, I fear, is going to harm the church. So my overarching two purposes for the next few minutes are to speak the truth, to tell the truth, and to do so in love. Now, my, um, I'm already behind a little bit here. Here's my central claim. I want you to, to ponder this for a moment. If Christians believe lies, repeat lies, or stay silent when lies are spoken, the cause of Christ must necessarily be harmed in the long run. I can't see, I can't understand how it is that God would honor lies or use them or, or work in them or through them. And I think we should all be distressed when a Jew, an atheist, and a homosexual are telling the truth, but many Christians are, are not. Now let me just give you a quick definition for, for woke. This is my definition. It's really based out of the Oxford English Dictionary. But uh, this is my phrasing. To be woke is to be alert to the reality that racism remains a major problem in American 
society. Uh, Eric Mason wrote a book called Woke Church a couple of years ago, and he said this, I believe that the call of God on the life of every evangelical Christian is to be woke. Um, and in this seminar, I'm going to argue the very opposite, in fact. Um, far better, ironically, is John Perkins. You may be familiar with John Perkins. He actually wrote the preface to this book, Woke Church, and this is what John Perkins said. Uh, Any authentic attempt to pursue unity and reconciliation must start with truth, to which I say, amen, John Perkins. But Martin Luther, I like as well. He said, peace if possible, but truth at all costs. If we suppress or ignore the truth or kind of pretend it's not there, then I'm afraid of what will, will happen uh, down the road. So let me give you the three, three points we're going to walk through. First is who are these intellectuals? And I'm going to go through this very quickly. I, I mentioned to someone earlier that I learned on the way to the airport this morning that this is a 50-minute seminar, not a 60-minute seminar. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, we're, we're going to, we're going to not dawdle because I, I want to, want to get through this. Uh, very briefly, who are these intellectuals? Um, where or in what ways are these thinkers telling the truth when others are not? And lastly, how should we remain discerning and listening to these voices? Um, firstly, who are these intellectuals? Um, ben Shapiro is a 37-year-old Orthodox Jew. When he was 17 years of age, he became the youngest nationally syndicated columnist in the United States. Um, graduated from Harvard Law School when he was 23, and today he runs a media company. He's written 16 books, and three of them are... New York Times bestsellers. Um, the atheist is Jordan Peterson. He's a Canadian uh, professor and psychologist. He came to prominence in 2016 when he spoke out against a bill in the Canadian legislature, which made it illegal to refer to a person by anything other than the pronoun that they want to be uh, referred to by. He opposed, opposed this bill C-16, which he has called the compelled speech law on the grounds that it was driven by radical ideologues. His, uh, his book, 12, 12 Rules for Life, has sold over 5 million copies. Uh, lastly, uh, Douglas Murray is a British writer and journalist who is a gay atheist. When he was a 19-year-old student at Maudlin College, Oxford, he wrote a biography of Lord Alfred Douglas, which Christopher Hitchens, also not a believer, uh, nevertheless called masterly. His most recent book is the New York Times bestseller, The Madness of Crowds. He is highly critical of the so-called so social justice movement and identity uh, politics. He's been described by some as one of the most important public intellectuals today. Uh, and although Murray is a classic uh, political liberal, he's highly critical of the radical left. Um, when I finished reading The Madness of Crowds, in the back flap, uh, I wrote these words. A gay atheist is calling out woke evangelicals for believing and spreading lies. It's time we listen. So those are the intellectuals that I want to suggest we have something to, uh, to learn from. And so I'm going to allude to uh, the ideas of these three thinkers as we, as we go um, along. And I think that they offer powerful critiques of uh, some non-Christian authors, such as Ibram X. Kendi, who wrote uh, How to Be an Anti-Racist, uh, Robin DiAngelo, who wrote White Fragility, and uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates, who has written Between the World and Me, as well as some Christians, such as Jamar Tisby, who wrote The Color of Compromise, Eric Mason, alluded to earlier, who wrote Woke Church, and Daniel Hill, uh, who wrote White Awake. Um, and all of these authors are pushing for the world to become and to stay woke. Um, you know, the Christian authors here, as I read each of their books, I. I just, I deeply lamented. I mean, as I read Jamar Tisby's book, The Color of Compromise, like if you're a, if you're like a sentient person and have a soul, I don't understand how you could read the first half of his book and not have tears in your eyes. As he describes the ugly, wicked complicity of the, the white evangelical church in racism. I mean, for decades and, and centuries even, it's hard to read that book and maintain your composure. Uh, for me, where the problem, uh, problems arose is in the second half of, of, uh, of his book and some of these other books, in which a, an analysis of where the world today is and, uh, and then the proposal of solutions. That was where I said, okay, I'm, I'm not really with you on, on the second half. All right, so where are these thinkers telling the truth? 
uh, when, when some others are not. Here's the first of, of six points that we're going we're gonna to cover. Is that, first of all, culture and behavior, behavior massively impact one's life outcomes for better or, or for worse. So we are told today that racism, sexism, homophobia, and bigotry are systemically present everywhere and in everything. Uh, some say that because these harmful ideas are so pervasive, it doesn't matter what actions an individual takes because the game is rigged to oppress disadvantaged groups. It's like it's not even worth addressing culture or behavior until you first eliminate or address racism. Now, here's an example. Um, Ibram X. Kendi, he decries racism based on uh, these things, biology and ethnicity, and I hope that all of us decry racism based on biology or ethnicity, right? But then he goes on in his list, and he includes culture and behavior. So Kendi claims that if you suggest that negative life outcomes might come about because of culture or behavior, that is a racist idea. Kendi says there's only two ideas in the world. There's racist ideas and there's anti-racist ideas. So racism based on bio biology and ethnicity, I'm with you 100%. But it's like we're not allowed to evaluate a person's culture or their behavior to determine if something that they did led to negative life outcomes such as poverty, imprisonment, or an early death. And he says no. And, and I say, oh, I'm not with you. I, I think it's imperative that we, that we evaluate culture as well as, as, well as behavior. That, that has to be a part of the conversation. Uh, so here's an example. I think Ben Carson, you know Ben Carson, I think his mom should be hailed as a hero for raising her son in inner city Detroit and yet requiring him to read two books every week, to write book reports, to behave, all these things. And look at, look at what it produced. Carson said in one of his writings that he read his way through the Detroit Public Library all the way to Yale. And here's my question, why, is, why do I not hear any praise from my woke brothers and sisters um, for a, a, a case like that? Um, I mean, someone who escaped a, a really awful culture in the inner city and has went on to become the most famous pediatric neurosurgeon in the world. I think we should be praise, praising that. The reality is that destructive culture and behavior have nothing to do with skin color. Nothing to do with skin color. Uh, let me let me let me uh, ask you this question: Which ethnic group is this author speaking of? Here's the quote: These people are creating a terrible problem in our cities. They can't or won't hold a job. They break the law constantly, and neglect their children. They drink too much, and their moral standards would shame an alley cat. For some reason or other, they absolutely refuse to accommodate themselves to any kind of a decent, civilized life. Quoted in Thomas Sowell. Who's he talking about? Uh, this author is someone writing in 1956 in Indianapolis. You know who he's writing about? He's writing about poor whites living in the South. You see, this, is, this was a toxic culture. And toxic cultures, that has nothing to do with race. Uh, my wife and I, we lived in a, in a ghetto for three years in, uh, among people who did not value education. They trashed their own neighborhoods. They got into fistfights. They were on um, welfare. Some of them had been unemployed for three generations. They consumed huge amounts of alcohol and vomited it up on the streets. These people were all white. This was in Durham, England, where we lived for, for three years. This is poverty of mind and spirit. It has nothing to do with skin color. It is 100% cultural. And it's sinful culture, I, I might add. You see, there are destructive subcultures among every uh, shade of, of skin color. On the one hand, a culture of gangster rap, to quote Thomas Sowell, uh, that's destructive, but so is a redneck hillbilly culture. All you have to do is read J.D. Vance's book, Hill, Hillbilly Elegy, regarding his growing up in, in Ohio and in Kentucky. This is not about color, it is about culture. Culture matters deeply, and, and so does behavior. And so I think we have to address and identify flaws within cultures of every color. It is a lie that every disparity is due to systemic 
uh, racism or white supremacy. Let, let me give you an example. This is something I learned the other day that was like, blew, blew my mind. Uh, a culture that values education is mandatory for success. I hope we all agree on that, okay? I recently learned that if a child is not reading on grade level by the time they're in third grade, the odds are they will never catch up. And hauntingly, the connection between failure to read on, on level by third grade and criminality later in life is so strong that those who make decisions regarding how many prisons to build make those projections based on how many kids currently can't read on level, uh, on level by grade three, and they do so one decade in advance. Is that tragic? I mean, that is tragic. Do you, you understand this? If in a particular area, let's say there's 5,000 kids uh, who are in, in third grade and they can't read on grade level, they literally say, we're going to need to have approximately you know, 5,000 uh, beds to add to the prisons in, in 10 years. That's absolutely tragic. Well, what about individual, individual um, decisions? Um, I, I pastored a, a, a very diverse multi-ethnic uh, church in Miami for six years that was kind of a, a happy mix of white people, black, black people, Latinos, African Americans, uh, black people from, from the Caribbean. And, uh, and I frequently saw children and adults sitting at the bus stop wearing $200 Beats headphones, a $1,000 iPhone, $200 sneakers, $100 shirt and shorts, living in a culture focused on appearance and on having all the right goods, but not interested in saving to buy a car, putting aside money for college or for the future. See, people should be free to make the choices that they desire, but to blame the inevitable later negative outcomes on racism instead of personal choices is absurd and it's dishonest. It's a lie to tell people that your decisions don't make any difference on your life outcomes. Now many um, who, are, who are woke, they claim that culture has nothing to do with negative life outcomes. It's just white supremacy and, and privilege. So Robin DiAngelo is an example of this. She writes, and this is a quote, that it is racist to attribute, in, attribute inequality between whites and people of color to causes other than racism. She only allows that. I, I, don't, even, I don't even know where to, to begin with that, but it's, it's shocking. Culture and behavior matter enormously on people's life outcomes. And it used to be okay to say this. In 1985, in the New York Times, Eleanor Holmes Norton, not exactly a dyed-in-the-wool conservative, she, quote, urged the overthrow of the predatory ghetto subculture. She impressed on her readers, quote, most important is passing on the enduring values that form the central content of the black American heritage, hard work, education, respect for family, and achieving a better life for one's children. And it's like, why does nobody say that today? Now, I would never suggest that culture and behavior are the only factors. Rather, they need to be considered at least as partial factors. If we know that something creates negative life outcomes and we, and we can control that, then why not put some focus on that? Well, the second way in which these authors and speakers are telling the truth is on the importance of two-parent homes. Here's a quiz. Who said the following in a speech? We need families to raise our children. We need fathers to realize that responsibility doesn't just end at conception. That doesn't just make you a father. What makes you a man is not the ability to have a child. Any fool can have a child. That doesn't make you a father. It's the courage to raise a child that makes you a father. Well, uh, I'll give you the answer in a moment, but a civil rights leader, another civil rights leader who's commenting on that speech, uh, he called the remarks on absent black fathers courageous and important, but cautioned that his words would not be embraced by all segments of the black community. There are a lot, he, he said, there are a lot of those who will say that he should not be airing dirty laundry, those who will say that he's beating up on the victims, he said in an interview. This will not be something that will be unanimously applauded, but I think that not dis discussing it will not make it go away. Well, who gave the speech? Um, this was President Obama, Barack Obama in 2008, and it was Al Sharpton who agreed with him, but thought that it was kind of inappropriate to be, to be airing um, these things. 
in, uh, in a New York Times article in 2008, when Obama was on the campaign trail, he said this, children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of schools, and 20 times more likely to end up in, uh, in prison. And I think that he's, he's right, but we haven't heard this recently. Uh, Obama and Sharpton said these things in 2008 before wokeness kind of swept the, swept the world. Uh, by the way, this is a side note, but I, this is a little uh, a statistic that I just find really fascinating. Um, in 2008, uh, Obama won 53% of the, the total of the total vote in the United States, 53% uh, of the popular vote. Um, 53%, but his approval rating was 73% one month after he was installed in office. Do you see what that means? That means that 20% of Americans who didn't vote for Obama were like, dude, okay, you're our president. Like, we don't like your policy, whatever. We weren't going to vote for you, but like now we're, we're behind you. And that just seems, that seems striking and it seems very telling. Um, it, it, that's, I hate to be sarcastic, but it's like that's odd behavior for a country filled with, supposedly filled with, with white supremacists. I think Obama in 2008 was, was right. But the reality is that there's an undeniable link between single parenting and poverty. According to the 2019 U.S. Census data, median household income for single mothers is $45,000 a year. Median household income for married couples is 97,000 a year. Now, many claim that, well, these disparities just are evidence of, of racism, but it appears as if the, at least the income part of the problem is largely solved by getting married and, and staying married and not having children in, until you do so. Doesn't that explain some of the, of, of the income gap between, between races? Um, ben Shapiro, um, I know some people love him, some people hate him, but he points out that when Jim Crow ended, the black single motherhood rate was 20%, whereas today it is 75%. And by the way, it's climbing across every racial group, among white people, among Latinos, among Asians as well. Well, let, let's test this for a moment. What are the poverty rates for married black couples? So the nationwide poverty rate in America is 14%. The poverty rate for married black couples is 7%. The poverty rate for single white moms is 22%. What happened to white privilege? If you want to stay out of poverty, get married before having children. Um, Shapiro cites a, a, a liberal think tank called the Brookings Institution, which reports this, that people are in a much better position. People are in a much better position to succeed if they honor certain basic norms, graduate from high school, get a full-time job, don't have a child before you're 21, and get married before child rearing. Among the people who do these things, according to the research of Ron Haskins and Isabel Sawhill of the Brookings Institution, about 75% of people attain to the middle class. And that applies to people of every skin color. Folks, we do not want people to have the idea that their actions don't have consequences. They certainly do. Um, and lastly, on this point, I would just say that a father like me, um, I take extreme umbrage at the suggestion that whether or not I stick around and am really committed to raising my children, uh, you know, whether that's really going to make a difference in their lives. That's a lie. Thirdly, they're telling the truth about, about police shootings. Um, thankfully, I have yet to hear anybody say that, well, it's okay for police to just shoot people randomly or like unarmed people or, or innocent people. I've never heard anybody say that or, or whisper it. But I want to suggest there's some questions I think that we need to we, we, we need to address regarding police shootings. Here, here are some examples. How many unarmed suspects are killed by police in an average year? Uh, secondly, are a disproportionate number of black people getting killed by the police? And if so, is that ipso facto proof of racism? Uh, when an unarmed black person is killed by police, is there any reason to believe that it was racially motivated? I think that's something that we just assume, well, it must have been. Well, how do we know that it was racially motivated? And lastly, are the circumstances in which these shootings um, occur uh, relevant. Well, here are the, here are the numbers. Uh, there are a, roughly a third of a billion people in, in America, three, about 330 million. In the average year, there are 50 million encounters nationwide with the police. There are 10 million arrests. There are 1,000 people who are killed by police. And 6% of them, or about 60, are unarmed. Now, black people make up 13% um, of the population, 
but they constitute 25% of uh, Black people make up 13% of the population, but about 25%, or roughly 15, of the unarmed suspects who are killed by the, the police are, are, are black. Now, white people make up 61% of the population, but only about 50% of the unarmed suspects killed by police are white. Is this disparity due to racism? Uh, when it is proven that a police officer has killed a black person, and it was racially motivated, uh, prosecute that cop lock him up and, and, and throw away the key or else a wicked injustice has been done. I, I, I hope we, we all agree with that. But if we're going to uncover the roots of this disparity, we have to address black on black crime. Every year, roughly 15 um, unarmed blacks are killed by the police, while five to 6,000 black people are killed by other black people. Four hundred black people are murdered for every one unarmed black person who's killed by the police. Now there's a book called Dear White Christian by Aaron Layton. I'm not with them on a hundred percent of everything, but I, the book is, is really good. It's worth reading. Um, Aaron Layton, who's, who's a black Christian, he writes this. The fact that black-on-black -black crime exists does not negate the fact that we should all challenge injustices towards blacks, to which I say, amen. Amen, Aaron Layton, I'm with you. But can we talk about the mouse and the elephant in the room? If not, why not? Here's another tragic juxtaposition, and, and I grant that this is off topic, but I'm going to bring this back in. Again, there are roughly 15 unarmed black people killed by police every year, yet there are 360,000 black children aborted every year. That's 24,000 times higher. And in cities, in cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York City, more black babies are killed than are born alive. Can we address the mouse? Yes, address the mouse. But can we address the elephant in the room too? And if not, why not? Where is the woke Christian outrage about the murder of these children? Black people make up 13% of the population, but 35% of all abortions. It's like, does the word genocide spring to anybody else's mind? Or the fact that Planned Parenthood locates 80% of their clinics, clinics in minority communities, does that rub anybody else the wrong way? You see, until these things are addressed, I'm not woke and I will not be an ally because this movement is spreading lies and is remaining willfully blind. Well, what about the disproportionality in uh, the deaths of, of, of black people. Um, I think here, here's the answer, is that police presence is higher and should be higher in areas where there is more crime. Therefore, blacks are more likely to encounter police in violent circumstances, so police are more likely to be prepared to use deadly force. Well, that begs the question, is there more violent crime in predominantly black neighborhoods? The answer is yes. According to the FBI stats, black people commit a little bit over 50% of all the murders in America, about 16,000 murders a year. Furthermore, black people are six times more likely to be murdered than whites, and 96% of blacks who are killed are killed by other black people. Tragically, the CDC reports that homicide is the number one cause of death for black men who are under the age of 44. One third of all deaths of all black men under 44 are due to homicide, and incidentally, 95% of these murders are um, committed by black people who are between 20 and 40 years years of age. Uh, a recent uh, McCulver Institute uh, report writes this, the unfortunate reality is that just as blacks are statistically far more likely to be the victims of homicide or other violent crimes, they are also statistically more likely to commit violent crimes that would bring them into conflict 
with a law enforcement officer with his or her gun drawn. This, not racism, is the reason for the disparity in the police shootings. You may have heard of uh, a black professor of economics at Harvard named Roland Fryer. He released a study in 2016 in which he surveyed 1,000 police shootings and determined that black suspects are shot significantly less often than white suspects in comparable situations. And it seems plausible that police may be more prone to use deadly force against black people since they are shot by black more often than by whites. Um, ben Shapiro points out that police are 18 and a half times more likely to be shot by a black male than an unarmed black male to be killed by police. In 2015, the Obama Justice Department studied the Philadelphia Police Department's use of force and determined that white officers were less likely to shoot an unarmed black suspect than were either black or Hispanic officers. Well, lastly on this, what about the circumstances in which um, that, that surround these police shootings? Are the circumstances relevant? Uh, I, I think they are. I did a, a deep dive on um, some of these cases where black people have been killed by, by police um, and, and just re really went deep. Once there was like a final report that came out, not just reading something in the news, but the final report, what actually happened here? And I was stunned at the contrast between the common accepted narrative and the actual facts of the case. Now this includes the murders of, or the deaths of people like Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, Eric Garner, Freddie Gray, Laquan McDonald, Walter Scott, George Floyd, Tanisha Anderson, Rayshard Brooks, and Tamir Rice. And what I realized is that with very few exceptions, there were two features that were common to police officers shooting unarmed suspects. The first is that the person committed a crime or the police were called because they were suspected of committing a crime. And secondly, they resisted arrest. Now, nobody believes that someone should be killed by police for committing a petty crime. Eric Garner, for example, was selling Lucy's. He was selling individual cigarettes uh, on the sidewalk in front of a store. Um, no one thinks that he should have died for that, right? But police, I wanna emphasize this like so much, police cannot be faulted for elevating the level of physicality when somebody resists arrest. Now, if we can't agree on that statement, like we're not gonna agree on anything. We cannot fault police for elevating the amount of force that they're having to use to bring a, a, a suspect right, um, you, you know, under their, under their uh, control. We can't fault them for that. And yet it's like, I don't hear any of my woke friends saying, don't, don't resist arrest. Like, why is that message not, not getting out? Why can't we address both the very, very rare cases in which police kill suspects and yet also convey that people must never resist arrest. I think Michael Brown is a case in point. No one believes, no one I've ever heard of, believes that Michael Brown should have been killed for stealing cigars. But when Michael Brown assaulted a cop, tried to grab his gun, I don't think the cop can be faulted for using deadly force. Um, Larry Elder said this, the idea that a racist, Larry Elder is a black uh, attorney and a, uh, um, has a, a radio program. The idea that a racist white cop shooting unarmed black people is apparel to blacks is, and I'll clean it up and just say he had two words in there, uh, it is false. The idea that to be black is to need to walk in fear of being killed by the cops is a myth. The data makes it clear that black people do not need to walk around afraid that the cops are gonna kill them because of subtle racism. The data doesn't support it. Um, well, let's go on to four. Uh, is these, these thinkers are telling the truth about the definition of terms, I think it's important to call out a really deceitful practice of subtly changing the definition of terms that have very long agreed upon meaning, meanings, such as racism, such as white supremacy. Uh, this is really dishonest and I think should be eschewed by, by Christians. Um, racism has always meant mistreatment of someone on the basis of their race, but that's not what it means anymore. Um, Here's an example. In The Color of Compromise, um, Jamar Tisby states that white supremacy is a concept that identifies white people and white culture as, look at the two words, as normal and superior. Um, wait, superior, yeah, if you think, well, white people are superior by virtue of being white, then I'm like, yeah, that's white supremacy, right? 
but as being normal or like more commonplace? Wait, that's white supremacy? Now, maybe I would, would say to Jamar, maybe instead of the most cynical interpretation imaginable, um, could it be that white skin is normalized in America because white people make up 61% of the population? Isn't that plausible? Uh, Jordan Peterson points this out. He suggests that the predominance of whiteness in the United States is due to whites being the majority. Um, you know, if you go to if you go to China and you just see Chinese people on all the on all the billboards, uh, maybe it's not because they're racist, but maybe because Chinese people are in the majority. I mean, isn't that isn't that possible? Um, it, it doesn't it make sense that if America is 61% white, 20% Latino? 13% um, black and 5% Asians that ads or band-aids or whatever are going to skew white that that just seems to make sense and it seems really cynical and almost paranoid to think that it's because of kind of this entrenched racism and then calling that white privilege um, Daniel Hill in White Awake he writes this that white supremacy stresses the belief not only that white people are superior but also that they're rightfully the dominant group now, I can imagine someone in the KKK saying that, like, yeah, that white people are rightfully the dominant, um, the dominant group. But then he goes on to skewer all white people as being as being guilty of, of uh, you know, white privilege and, and white supremacy. And that just seems that seems wrong to me, you know, as if the average white person believes that, well, we're rightfully the dominant group. Look, there are white supremacists. I mean, true white supremacists who believe that white skin is better by virtue of, of, of the color of, of their skin. But what's happened here with the, the current literature is that seeing that there are, I think, so few white supremacists today, I'm talking like an actual white supremacist. And, you know, when you hear about one, you're like embarrassed, you're ashamed that there are actually white people who would think that about being white. Uh, so what's happened is that racism has now moved out of the individual realm, the individual level, into the ubiquitous systemic. Now, this is what Robin D'Angelo writes, and I felt a little bit like, this is interesting that a white woman is lecturing all the rest of us white people about how horrible we are. You know? Well, anyway, she writes this, white supremacy captures the all-encompassing centrality and assumed superiority of people defined and perceived as white. It does not refer to individual white people and their individual intentions or actions, but to an overarching political, economic, and social system of domination. Racism is a structure, not an event. So racism doesn't mean a person who thinks, says, or does a racist thing. That's old school racism. It's not what the woke mean by racism. In the words of Jamar Tisby, and he's really quoting Beverly Tatum, uh, today racism is prejudice plus power. So if a person doesn't have power, they can't be a racist, uh, unless if they're white, and then you are a racist because you're, you're white. So D'Angelo avers that only whites can be racist because they hold the controls of power, which of course is asinine. Thankfully, I'm, I take joy in the fact that it isn't just white people in positions of power. The reality is that people of every race can be racist. Um, Shelby Steele, he calls, calls their, their bluff. He says that leftists today are forced to appeal to racist systems rather than raci uh, racist actions because racism is so hard to spot today. Uh, whereas 60 years ago, racism was easy to identify, right? It was everywhere. I mean, think about slavery, for heaven's sake. Think about Jim Crow and these other evil things. But for Jamar Tisby, for example, there will, racism is, is everywhere. There always will be racism. He writes this. Since the 70s, Christian complicity in racism has been more difficult to discern. It's hidden, but does it, that does not mean it no longer exists. As we look more closely at the realm of politics, we see that Christian complicity with racism remains, even as it has taken on subtler forms. Again, we must remember that racism never goes away. It adapts everywhere but nowhere. I don't know if you hear a problem with that, but if you put together his definition of white supremacy, with this claim regarding the ubiquity of racism, he is implying that all people, all white people are complicit in, in racism. And I think that's appalling and that's actual racism. I think we should demand um, evidence of racism when someone, um, uh, we must demand evidence when evaluating a claim of institutional or systemic racism. Uh, ben Shapiro, he says this, 
When people say that there's institutional racism, what does that mean? Show me a law that is racist in intent, and we will agree. Show me a police officer who commits a racist act, like we saw in South Carolina. He's alluding to Walter Scott, by the way. Where a police officer shot a black man running away, and it was obviously unjustified, and I will agree. But the idea that racism is systemic, because it must be somewhere out there in the ether, that doesn't solve problems for anybody. Rather, it creates more problems. Because now, people grow up in an environment in which they're told that every obstacle that they face is from some shadowy, nameless, faceless group that is out to get them simply because of their, the color of their skin. They'll never succeed in that environment. Um, and I, I, think he's, I think he's right on, on that point. Uh, let me move on with a little bit more briskness here. Um, fifthly is the truth that wokeness is neo-racism. Denigrating somebody for an inborn racial characteristic is, is vile. That's a disgusting thing. That, that is racism. It doesn't matter your color, your gender, your nationality. People of blank race are blank. And put something negative in this blank, that, that's racism. Um, now some, uh, what makes me sad is I think some people are, are comfortable saying that today among the, among the woke. Um, so in a recent Christianity Today article, um, Christina, uh, the article is titled, The Shocking Necessity of Racist Violence. Christina Edmondson wrote, white Christianity's very design exists to maintain false piety and sear the consciences of white people against the oppression and exploitation of blacks. And to me, that just sounds moderately, moderately racist. Um, what about these kinds of claims? White people are all complicit in white supremacy. Or white people are assumed to be racist until they prove that they're sufficiently anti-racist. That's right out of Ibram X. Kendi. I don't understand how we can, um, how we can applaud, applaud those sorts of things. What happened to MLK's vision of a, of a society in which people are judged on the basis of their character and not the color of their skin? I think Douglas Murray nails it when he says, defining an entire group of people, their attitudes, pitfalls, and moral associations based solely on their racial characteristics is itself a fairly good demonstration of racism. It is a denial of the image of God for a person to apologize for an immutable attribute of their personhood, and this includes skin color. So I don't know if you've seen this, white people and white pastors apologizing for their whiteness. That should be as upsetting as, imagine a black person or an Asian person or a Latina coming up to you and apologizing for the color of their skin. I, I hope that's just appalling and disgusting to you. Well, it, it, it should be. Um, now, it's, there's just unambiguous instances of this neo-racism. Just a few days ago, Lori Lightfoot, the mayor of Chicago, announced that she will only give interviews to black and brown journalists. And even, get this, even an NBC reporter pushed back. When NBC pushes back, <laughs> right, you know that this is bad. Let me, I'm going to out some people, and i sorry if I, if I hurt your feelings. Let me give you an ugly little secret. Many white allies are going along with this movement publicly, but their hearts are not with you. Uh, beware of white folks who appear to be allies, because more than once I've gotten into private conversations, you know, casual over a beer with some of, some of my woke Christian friends who, who sheepishly admit that there's really not good evidence, that there's just pervasive racism everywhere. Uh, the reality is they're, they're with you because they're scared not to be with you. Um, it, it turns out that this movement, I realized kind of after studying this for a long time, that this movement doesn't actually care about skin color. It cares about a radical agenda. Why is it that Clarence Thomas, just some examples, Condoleezza Rice, Thomas Sowell, and Ben Carson are called Uncle Tom? That is a vile, racist term to call somebody that. If black people don't have the right views, they're traitors to their race. I think this too is, is racism. And I probably shouldn't go here, but it's like, and I'm sure... All of you are going to hate me after I say this, but I don't care. And I have five minutes. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Who's more racist, our current president or the one before? The one who said such horrible things about people who cross the border that they're all rapists? Well, is that worse than Biden saying you ain't black if you don't vote for me? It's shocking that both presidents would say such vile things. Shocking. Uh, lastly, the truth about intellectual... Uh, honesty. It's dishonest to claim that being woke is the only loving, compassionate way to think. These are the in intellectuals who have influenced me deeply. 
Um, Thomas Sowell, Shelby Steele, John McWhorter, Glenn R Lowry, Coleman Hughes, Walter Williams, Jason Riley, Larry Elder. They have profoundly influenced, influenced my views. And my woke friends have never even heard of these people. At least hear the other side of this, right? Um, well, I've got other things that I need to cut through because I want to get to the, the heart of this. Um, ironically, unbelieving, anti-woke thinkers have unearthed the religious structure behind wokeness and have stumbled upon the power of forgiveness. Get this, John McWhorter, a black professor at Columbia, who's an atheist, he says that wokeness is a religion. How so? Well, you have original sin. What's original sin? White privilege. White privilege will never change no matter what you do. Even if you're totally uneducated, live in Appalachia, don't have plumbing in your house or any teeth, you still benefit every day from the original sin of white privilege. Uh, this religion has priests. They include Robin DiAngelo, Ibram X. Kendi, ta Coates, Right, these, these woke type thinkers. There's uh, this idea of rapture. The woke say that they're waiting for America to come to terms with its America to come to terms with its racism. What does that mean exactly? Heresy. It explains why if someone is insufficiently woke, they have to get excommunicated by losing their job, being harassed online, or canceled, and you have to suspend disbelief. You're not allowed to use reasoning or look at the facts. That can do what I would call King James only fundamentalism, and this one is kind of juicy. I like this one, boy. The self righteousness. Uh, John McWhorter says, white people, especially well-educated white people, really enjoy showing the idea that they're not racist. Well, this is known as performative allyship, which is when a person presents himself as a friend of the woke cause, but is only doing so because it will give him social capital and protect him from accusations of racism. Folks, if you believe the way to be forgiven your racism is to trust in Jesus and commit to doing the work of anti-racism, that is a false gospel because it adds to the work of Jesus Christ. If the way of forgiveness for any sin is anything other than Jesus alone, Jesus plus being woke, that's a false gospel. I want to show you this very quickly in Douglas Murray. His, this was a sh amazing to me reading this in Douglas Murray. He talks about forgiveness. He quotes Hannah Arendt, who wrote, we have no possibility ever to undo what we have done. Actions are irreversible. There is no author or maker who can undo what he has done if he does not like it or when the consequences prove disastrous. And then Murray writes this. Um, Arendt says that only one tool exists to ameliorate the irreversibility of our actions. That is the faculty of forgiving. This is, a, this is a, an atheist, folks. These two things necessarily go together. The ability to bind together through promises and the ability to stay bound through forgiveness. Woke Christian, can you take a rebuke from a gay atheist who has it right when maybe you do not? Well, finally, how do we remain discerning and listening to these voices? None of these men know the Lord. Not one of them. They need Jesus Christ. They're unbelievers. And we should pray for them and be very cautious in drinking up all that they are saying. We should have our guard up. You know, to Christians on the right, I want to ask this question, and I hope you'll really consider this. Even though you may have never committed some overt act of, of racism, are you so sure that the history of racism in America, including slavery, Jim Crow, societal mistreatment, could not have lingering effects for black people? Well, I feel sure that it does. Are you willing to push yourself in an empathetic direction and try to see things from another person's standpoint? Are you, are you actually a racist? I mean, do you actually believe that any group is, is better than another by virtue of, of their skin color? That's wicked. There will be people, praise God, of every skin color, every li uh, uh, tongue, every nationality gathered around the throne of God forever. The gospel, my friends, is not Jesus plus stay woke. The gospel is not Jesus plus be pro-life. The gospel is Jesus plus nothing. And then and only then does a person begin the process of mortifying the sin of racism to which people of every race are susceptible. The only way to do that in a God-honoring way is to begin on a foundation of truth regarding race. Then God will bring healing to you, me, and to our world, but not until then. I'll put this up on the screen if you want to you know, take a picture of that. That's fine. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I would... I'll stick around. I would love to talk with any of you, but let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for these few minutes. I pray that we would be very wise in discerning and 
uh, what we read and how we read and that which we accept as true. I pray that these words would have uh, stirred up true uh, thinking about you and your world. We pray that you would be honored as a result of our time. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you all for coming.